welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hi folks, and welcome to episode 72 of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. And this week, I have a real privilege in being able to join Glenn Ashby uh, from Emirates Team New Zealand, uh, who was the winning skipper and wing trimmer in the 2017 edition of the Cup in Bermuda, and now uh, takes on the title of Cup Defender. Uh, for the upcoming 2021 AC36 America's Cup on Auckland Harbour. So given there's been a lot published on this topic previously, I really wanted to avoid the nostalgia of drilling into the 2013 disappointment in San Francisco and the 2017 success in Bermuda and really focus on what's coming up next in the 2021 America's Cup that includes this exciting new 75-foot falling monohull design with a soft wing sail that's uh, really quite revolutionary and if you were like me when you first saw the uh, YouTube video uh, artist's uh, impression of it uh, last year uh, it looked rather alien like with the uh, ballasted foils that that lift up and down um, on each side of the boat so so with this unique opportunity to talk to Glenn Ashby, albeit from an airport uh, airline lounge as he was due to depart on a flight overseas, uh, it really gave me the opportunity to drill into the new design and, and the thinking behind it and some of the things that we're going to see that are quite different about this next America's Cup. So it's a bit of a technical episode, uh, but Glenn uh, candidly shares his thoughts on upward and starts, the ability for these yachts to fly on floors 100% of the time around the track, the, the changes to crew selection with having 11 sailors back on board now and really this futuristic design that's really this amazing hybrid of a little bit of tradition, a little bit of future that uh, I think even a catamaran purist could love. So I'm excited about what's coming up next with the Cup. I've been a America's Cup uh, fan of and follower of Team New Zealand since 1987, since uh, New Zealand first entered the America's Cup. So, you know, the last 32 years of my life have uh, seen lots and lots of uh, highlights a few lowlights, uh, and uh, I just love the technology. I love the the nationalistic uh, nature of New Zealand's team, and I love the passion they have for the sport uh, on the water. and And um, I get excited uh, with the evolution, with the changes, even when they're not always ideal. Uh, we've gone from monoholes to trimarans to catamarans and back to monoholes, but you know, few could few could debate that uh, the changes haven't been exciting. Uh, given we're now talking about speeds of 45, 50 knots. And the potential to to break that fifty knot barrier or that hundred kilometer an hour barrier on water. Uh, so enjoy this episode with Glenn Ashby from Emirates Team New Zealand. People walk into me and say I'm sorry. Glenn, how you doing? G'day, Dave. Yeah, good. How's how's things? Yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks for squeezing me in. What? T- how much time have you got? So, no, it's not pretty good, mate. Got uh, got about an hour, so I'm uh, I'm I'm in good shape. So I'm um, hopefully uh, it's not just too noisy in the background. I sort of tried to find the uh, quietest uh, quietest sort of nook, nook that I could jump into. So hopefully it'll be all right. I uh, know you've done well. I can't hear anything at all. So that's really good. Perfect, perfect, perfect. No, nice, nice, nice. What sort of um, time frame are we sort of looking at here, Dave? Just as sort of a, as a rough guide for for what you what you do. I've uh, prepared thirty two questions for you, so um, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll fill up most of the hour, but I'll, I'll just be conscious of your time, so I can uh, I can make sure I wrap up so that you're not short of time. Uh, and yeah, no, no worries. Most of the stuff sort of forty five minutes to you know an, an hour plus. So you know, it's as long as. As long as you want, it's as long as you want it to be. Yeah, no, no dramas, mate. No, look, that's uh, that's fine. We'll, we'll we'll crack off and just see see how we uh, how we go. It's sort of it's bloody hard to find a quiet spot, so there might be a bit of a uh, bit of airport action in the background, but <laughs> we'll see how we go. That's all right. You're a, you're a, you're a busy guy, so uh, I'm sure people appreciate that. Um, so um, no worries. So no worries. Well, um, I mean, I just have to. I mean, thank, thanks for agreeing to to have a chat on the Ocean Sailing podcast. No worries. And um, I mean, I'm a Kiwi living in Australia. You're, a, you're an Australian living in New Zealand, and, and I mean, how does it feel to be part of that? It's a very exclusive list that uh, includes a uh, crowded house, uh, far lap, uh, Russell Crowe, well, may, maybe not Russell Crowe, but you know, that, <laughs> that, that, that New Zealand claim, claim is their own um, uh, in terms of uh, being a favourite Australian. Yeah, look, I mean, it's 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 bloody nice, you know, like we, we love it over here, and I think it, 
at the end of the day, you know, we're, the culturally there's so many similarities between the two countries that really, you know, whether you're, you know, I'm at the airport at the moment and uh, whether you're, you know, leaving out of Auckland or, or leaving out of Melbourne, it's, it's you know, it's hard to sort of pick which one you're going from or going to. So, you know, look, it's, it's great. You know, we, we have a, a really good time um, in both countries, but certainly our, our um, you know, our work and, uh, and friends in New Zealand are, um, you know, very important to us. And it's, um, you know, it's nice to be part of such a great group and a great team and, you um, you know, sometimes you've got to pinch yourself that, uh, you know, what you do for, for your sort of your sport and your hobby, um, uh, you know, can also be your lifestyle and your work. So, um, you know, very lucky. Oh, that's good. Uh, I mean, I, I read online. I mean, I was conscious that you were here a couple of months ago doing the A-Class Worlds um, up in up on the Sunshine Coast. And congratulations, I think, on your 13th world title, was that, um, in the A-Class, in the A-Class cat itself? Uh, actually, I think it might have been, yeah, but I think it was number two. 10 I think for the for the A class and I think yeah, sort of 16 or 17 I think overall uh, with you know the, including other classes and stuff that you've done previously but look it's 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 one of those ones that you know the the, the A cat's been a lot of fun over the years and um, you know I really enjoy jumping on and sailing um, you know sailing the A you don't get to do it all that often but um, you know I guess sort of you know some of those earlier years where you've you know put in a bit of effort and um, you know that 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 experience sort of hopefully you know gets you back up to speed again you know relative quickly you certainly have to still put in a, in a big effort you know before any any event to uh to, to you know make sure that you're, you're, you're even close to the pointy end but um you know it's um like a lot of other people that sail a lot of other classes you know you um you know you, it, it just doesn't just doesn't happen you know without putting in in any effort so um it was great you know this last uh event up in in queensland to you know to have um both uh, blair and, and pete um, you know, involved. Um, we did it as a bit of a group. We did some training. Ray Davies was, um, you know, involved with a bit of coaching back on the uh, the Mornington Peninsula at McRae, where we sort of spent a couple of weeks of sort of doing some pretty hardcore, intense sort of training and learning. And um, yeah, no, it was great. You know, it was uh, you know Pete and Blair both did extremely well. And uh, um, yeah, nice to keep them on their toes. But um, you know, at the end of the day, those guys are uh, you know pretty pretty bloody handy yachties on so many different boats. So uh, you know, t- together as a group, it was it was great to you know be successful. And I think um, hopefully that um, you know you know that group that we do have right across the sailing team and, and coaching team and wider team in general, hopefully that diversity that we do have in different classes and different disciplines is uh, you know is one of our strengths um, you know compared to our opponents um, moving forward. Uh, absolutely, and there's a, a question I got for you later on on that, but um, it's good when the the old fellas have still got their touch and haven't lost it, I guess, from your, your point of view. <laughs> no disrespect. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, you you just have to look at uh, Santiago Langer, you know, good mate that um, you know won the gold medal in the NACRA 17, you know, in the last Olympics, and you know he's I think was well into his 50s, and uh, you know managed to put a gold clanger around his neck, and uh, you know an absolute inspiration to all of us, and uh, you know I think it just goes to show that um, you know uh, age is really no barrier, you know, when you put your heart and your soul into it, and um, you know he certainly. Um, you know, put a fantastic effort in over the years, and you know, sometimes that experience, um, you know, is, is worth its weight in gold. And uh, I think that was a fantastic example of, um, you know, something where at, at, at you know high pressure, high level, um, you know, sort of events that um, you know sometimes a an older head can can mix it up with the uh, the young guys coming through. So it's um you know it's a it's a great sport, and it's something we're very fortunate um, as yachties, you know, to, to to be involved in, no matter what sort of discipline you're sailing. Uh, absolutely, and probably more in sailing more than any other sport I know. You can enter at any age, and you can still be successful at you know quite a senior age. It's, it is quite an amazing sport like that. It is. Look, it's um you know there's uh you know the, right the way through from from youth into into you know into your your eighties and nineties. You know there's um people that are that are still sailing and competing really really well, and I think that's that's one thing. You know like you know there's there's other sports that sort of do that as well. Um you know golf and and tennis and those sorts of sports. You know you, you can go right the way through, um and you compete in your your age group and you know athletics and the, there's so many sports that have different divisions and age groups that um you know that that cater for, for, for the youth right the way through and I think um, you know sailing something that you know the skills that you learn you know whether you're young or middle-aged or older um, you know you, there's always something to learn it doesn't matter how long you've been doing the sport for and that's certainly something for me personally that I, I really enjoy you know now I'm you know I'm 41 years old now I've been sailing since I was sort of you know a little kid and uh, every time you go out on the water you're, you're learning something new and and you know right now just over the last sort of few weeks I've been trying to learn how to uh, you know, 
foil board on the on the windsurfer and um you know foiling windsurfing is not something that i've ever really done before i've done quite a lot of windsurfing before but um yeah i mean i'm, I'm just as green as grass like i'm absolutely at the bottom end of the of the learning scale and and really raw and um you know you have a lot of uh you know a lot of uh tip overs and capsizes off the off the windsurfer so to speak but you know hopefully over you know the next few months i can learn some new skills and i don't think it matters whether you're in your yeah you know in your teens or your your late 60s or 70s there's always something new to learn and whether it's even in the same class or or same type of boat that you've been sailing for years and years you know there's always something new to learn and and, and, and learning off other people so uh, that makes it pretty cool mm, absolutely absolutely um nick maloney introduced me to which is fantastic and um he talks about this innate ability that you have to just understand the dynamics and forces at play on the water and interpret them better than most other sailors around you i mean how, where, where did that innate ability come from and how, are, you, are you conscious of that sort of extra extra sort of sixth sense that you have um, yeah, good question. I mean, I've obviously had some fantastic years previously sailing with uh, with Nick on the Extreme 40 and, uh, you know, coming off the, the Tornado sailing with Darren Bundock and being able to mix it up with some sailing with Nick. I mean, you know, he's one that, you know, is absolutely has some innate ability to uh, to, to get around the world and, and, and around the track on the, uh, on the water. But, um, look, it, it's one of those ones I think that I've really enjoyed you know, my sailing and being on the water, I think, since I was a kid. And I guess for a lot of people that, you know, you, you know, it just, it, it just doesn't happen. You know, you, you, you have to work at it. And I think, um, you know, I think if you really, really enjoy what you do and, and you, you, you love the, the sailing side of things, the racing side of things is, is another part that just falls into place if you're a little bit competitive. And I probably am a little bit competitive with, you know, with a few things. And, you know, at the end of the day, you just, um, you know, that hunger to be successful and the hunger to win, um, you know, drives you along. And that, that hunger, I guess, you know, forces you to learn more. Mm-hmm. Um, it forces you to um, keep pushing yourself and, and pushing the boundaries of um, you know, not only not only your your physical ability but your mental ability also, and and also um, forces you into um, you know taking things on that you you know you, you don't have a lot of uh, necessarily knowledge about that you have to learn about quite quickly, and, and certainly in a you know a team environment versus a sort of a single-handed environment, if you like, um, it's a really different skill. I mean, you can you can be really good at single-handed sailing, you know, lasers, fins. Um, um, you know, ACATs, moths, whatever it may be. But, you know, to work in a team environment, um, you know, is a very, very different uh, a different kettle of fish. And I think um, being able to, you know, recognise the differences in, um, you know, those uh, those those different fields i think is 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 one thing just being able to uh to 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 be in a position where you can actually um you know learn from you know listening to yourself but also learn you know from listening to others i think is something that's really important and um yeah i think down the track you know who knows who knows what'll happen but um certainly for me i've I've been very fortunate to uh do some some great racing and 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 meet some fantastic people right the rep you know, right around the world, which I think is you know, certainly traveling has, has been one, you know, byproduct for me that's been a, a real, real joy since sort of being in my teens. And I think, um, you know, just learning and listening um, to a lot of different people uh, is, is something that I think has certainly helped me. And I, you, know, you talk about sixth sense. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it's really just a, a willing to learn and, and willing to listen. I think that, 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 you know, sometimes can make the difference. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, I read that after Bermuda, you came home and grabbed the family and a satellite phone and kind of went bush for the month just to just to kind of get away from it all and take some time out. I mean, how do you how do you stop? How do you take time out and not not just think about the America's Cup twenty four seven given the complexity and variables and everything that's going on uh, around you all of the time? Yeah, look, at um, really good question. When you're when you're involved, it's it, it does sort of the you know the, the 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 enormity of it all sort of the pressure does build up over a period of time. And when you finally you know get to finish that campaign and you get to draw a line in the sand and you know win, lose or draw, it's it's a big sort of um, you know come down if you like after after a big event, whether it be you know a World Championship and Olympics or you know certainly in the America's Cup case, there's a lot of people involved and a lot going on. So um, you know, it was a it was a 
you know, once we got back, um, we we did the um, you know the celebrations and the parades back here uh, in New Zealand, and um, you know once we got back to to Australia and managed to hook up the uh, the van and load the motorbikes and the windsurfers and the surfboards and uh, bits and pieces on the uh, on on the van and the car, it was um, yeah. Look, for me, it was just about you know getting as far away from the water as I possibly could for a little while, and 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 as far away from people and actually just not talking about it, and not. Um, having to think about it really was, um, you know, the really, for me, um, the only way to sort of decompress, if you like. And, um, you know, when you're in the middle of uh, the outback, there's not too many people that know much about the America's Cup. So that was a pretty good place to go and hide <laughs> and, uh, you know, get, get away from it. And, again, you meet some really, really interesting characters and interesting people and, you know, you're sitting around a fire somewhere and meeting new people that have, you know, done lots of other cool things in their life at times and, you um, you know that was a really cool way to um, to reflect, and you know when you are are away from civilization, um, you know with your family, it, it's a good way of spending time together, and um, you know it was a, it was a great um, way to sort of um, you know have closure with with the enormity um, that we'd just sort of been through, and obviously you're still staying in touch with the you know with the guys and and back and forth from time to time, and you know everyone was in a pretty good space, but as far as you know just being able to get the job done, tick the box and step away. Um, for me, actually getting getting away from everything and not sort of being immersed around it, you know, around sailing and around, um, you know, being at home with, with, you know, your mates and that sort of thing. You know, we, we all caught up when we got back, but, you know, when you could sort of tick those boxes and catch up with everyone but then get away, um, it really did, um, you know, let the uh, – you could really drop your shoulders and just sort of reflect on, um, you know, what, what had just happened and that was a pretty, uh, you know, pretty cool feeling and nice to be able to get away and see some, some fantastic countryside at the same time mm, and it's amazing when you've got kids like it doesn't matter what you do in business or sports dad's still dad right and it's just still the simple things kids love no matter what what dad does when dad's not home there's dad's still dad Absolutely, and and you know the the girls, um, you know we've got um, my wife and, and two girls that are you know seven and nine, and and both Lani and Holly, they sort of you know they they've lived the, I guess the the America's Cup sort of program, you know since they were born, um, both of them, and it's been you know it's been a, a bit of a journey, and for them to be able to sort of be part of that journey, and then sort of see and be old enough to to sort of experience the realization of, you know winning and losing and and that sort of thing, and and obviously. You know, this time round or last time round, coming out, um, you know, on, on the right side of it was uh, was fantastic for them, and um, you know, they yeah, they 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 got to finally spend some time with with dad. You know, after after that, it all sort of finished. It's pretty hard to uh, to be a full time dad when you're trying to be full time in the in the America's Cup, but um, you know, that's part of the price you pay, and that's why when you do get a little bit of downtime, that you, you absolutely have to make the most of that time, you know, together and and really enjoy, you know, uh, being able to do that because you know it comes time again where new challenges present themselves and you have to make a decision as to whether you you know you move forward sideways or backwards uh, in, into different things and um, you know for the for the family it certainly is a big sacrifice that they make um, for, for, for what what we do um, whether it be um, you know the Olympics is very similar sort of a you know it is you know a bit of a sort of a selfish um, you know commitment at times but having your family support um, and your friends support um, you know makes a, a huge difference and to be able to sort of bring them along on the journey you know is is great and um, you know a tough tough gig but um, it's it's you know probably something that you're not going to be able to do forever so um, you know make the most of it while you can and hopefully those memories that the the kids have and the family and and your mates have, you know, while you're cruising along, you know, doing something a little bit different. Um, hopefully, something that's something that sort of can rub off, and you know, that everybody can get a little bit out of along the way. Well, it's definitely stuff that will inspire them in their lives and things they'll, the experience they'll remember for the rest of their lives when they're old enough to be able to remember it, remember it like that. For sure. So, I'm going to jump into the next America's Cup um, and some questions for you around that. And I guess the first one is the the design of the 75 foot monohull for the next cup. I mean, when I first saw the video that came out on that, it almost looked um, alien-like. It was just such an incredible, incredible design. Nobody could have ever picked or guessed. I mean, how did how did that develop and evolve um, from into that concept? 
Yeah, look, it's um, you know obviously you know, as the, the sort of custodian of the America's Cup, if you like, you get to uh, you know you get the the right of being able to sort of choose what type of boats you <laughs> you're going to sail, and certainly um, you know that 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 concept that was created, you know there was a lot of different concepts on the table, and um, you know that 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 concept that we have now sort of emerged through a you know I guess a bit of a series of elimination of of other concepts that um, you know weren't you know we didn't feel were, were quite as as good, and what has been created, I think, is 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 going to be something that you know the world has never ever seen before, um, and I think it's going to be absolutely you know incredibly uh, successful and in- incredibly um, interesting to to see these boats come online. The 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 numbers and the the simulations that we have at the moment, obviously not having any of the big boats on the water, but you know seeing the smaller boats getting going now, the test boats, you know the the big boats, the you know the 75 footers will be absolutely incredible in their in their performance, but not only in the performance we're seeing is also in the handling and the manoeuvrability so from a sort of a pure match racing sense um and boat on boat sort of competition um you know there'll be some fantastic challenges um but there'll be also some some great racing and um and some really really tight battles and i think that's um something that if you sort of go through a bit of a series of you know ticking boxes of what you'd ultimately like to see um you know for the america's cup and also for your sport you want to see you know technology you want to see high performance you want to see athleticism uh, all those sort of factors, you sort of go through the boxes and you keep ticking. And certainly the manoeuvrability side of things and, um, you know, the performance side was something that, you know, us as a team were very, very, um, you know, we thought that was, you know, the right move going forwards. And I think um, hopefully the concept that we've, uh, you know, come up with as a team, there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of effort through a lot of the designing and the engineering and the sailing team as well, all working together to, you know, be able to come up with um, a, a boat that, um, you know, in conjunction with Luna Rossa, um, you know, is, is you know, something I think the world will have never seen before and hopefully be one of the um, you know, most spectacular America's Cups that's uh, ever been seen coming up in another year or two. Uh-huh. Absolutely. And, I mean, the, the capsize that happened in Bermuda was, was um, at the time, was just uh, terrible, but it made, it made us all appreciate how, how fragile these kind of speed machines are when it all goes wrong. And so with, with this design, with the move back to like a soft, a soft wing sail, is that, is that part, is part of the thinking that it's kind of more, more able to be robust in a capsize or, or recover from that kind of accident more easily than having to rebuild a wing in a crazy amount of time like you had to in Bermuda? Um, yeah, look, good, good question. I think, you know, the, the, what was sort of one of the, um, things that was discussed with the, you know, the design of the boat was, you know, what, what features and functions and design, um, with the yacht could actually sort of trickle down if you like into, into other, other, other boats moving forwards. And, you know, wing sails are, you know, obviously extremely efficient and, you know, beautiful to use and, you know, absolutely amazing pieces of kit, but, you know, they do come with their, their drawbacks as well, i.e. the fact that you need to put them up and down with a crane every day and, you know, they, they are fragile in a, in a capsized situation. So the idea with the twin skinned main sail um, concept on the back of a sort of a D spar mast section was to create um, basically a soft version um, of that wing sail. So whilst you don't have the sort of the, the exact controllability, um, you know, of, of sort of stiff panels that get controlled, you know, um, in a different way, um, the twin mainsail concept is sort of utilising sort of aerodynamically a very very sort of clean shape, um, but also you know it allows you to you know drop the sails put them in a sail bag at the end of the day and bring the boat into the dock and, and not have to worry about craning wings out and, and getting them down in the shed and all that sort of thing. So with the, the trickle-down effect, you know, there could easily be boats um, in the future that, that use that same sort of technology, and that's obviously being pioneered at the moment by, um, you know, obviously we're, you know, the conjunction that we have with, with North Sales, we're working very, very hard on uh, the development process with that at the moment um, with the team. And, um, you know, I think in the future um, there will be some fantastic trickle down through you know through the the different fleets and whether it be from a maxi boat down to sort of you know 20 and 30 footers i think that um that technology that's being developed and that controllability at the moment if you like will certainly um you know filter down and that's something that um you know was talked about when we did the initial design that you know we wanted to have some trickle down effects and the foiling side of things and the way that the the boats actually foil we've already seen um you know other boats that have come out um since that design concept was announced that are um you know that are out there ripping around now and performing 
performing exceptionally well for, for, for their size. And, um, you know, we're only in the infancy of that. It's, it's only going to get better. And um, I think it's a, you know, it's a pretty exciting time. And uh, I think we're all very fortunate that we, that we get to be, you know, around at this period of, uh, of the sport where there is so much development and, um, you know, big leaps forward in performance and, uh, and technology. Well, and it's a quantum leap for minor holes especially uh, from where they were. It's just incredible. Look, it is. Um, the, you know, the, the, Look, some of the numbers that we're seeing at the moment are going to have the boats, um, you know, going quicker than what we saw the um, the AC50 catamarans that we used in in the last America's Cup. You know, with the, some of the performances are, are, are far in excess of what those boats were doing. Wow. So, um, it's pretty exciting. I, I can't sort of go into too much detail, obviously, but it it is going to be extremely exciting. And um, you know, the boats are going to be, um, yeah, absolutely incredible. I think they'll. Blow, blow people away when, when they actually get launched and um, you know and we learn how to <laughs> we learn all how to sail them and get them around the track there'll certainly be some some learning and um, there will be capsizing and there will be uh, you know some things to learn and you know that's the beauty of it you, you know as we saw in the in the last America's Cup and the one previously uh, and the one before that to be honest um, you know massive developments and it, it appears that sort of you know a month or two before the America's Cup nobody can even get the boats around the race track and then strangely enough come race time you know, there's, um, you know, we're seeing, you know, 100% fly time around the track, you know, foiling tacks, foiling jibes, um, fantastic pre-start duels and battles. And, um, you know, that's just the way it goes. You, you, everyone in all the teams puts in a massive effort and it all ends up culminating in, you know, this event called the America's Cup. And ultimately that's the, the test at the end of the day of, of the team as a, as a whole is, you know, whether your boat crosses the finish line ahead of the other guys. And that's, um, you know, where it's so exciting, not just for the guys sailing on board who ultimately just get to be the, you know, the, the 1% at the end as far as actually finishing the job. It's the 99% of work that gets done before that that actually you know, is the success, the key to either success, winning or losing, uh, you know, of what gets done there. So, no, it's exciting times and, um, you know, we're all, we're all pretty fortunate to be able to be involved, um, you know, and, uh, you know, hopefully pioneer some, some cool stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And, what I mean, it's, it's exciting to kind of understand, to go from two holes to one and then from a hard wing to a soft, a soft wing and then talk about going faster. Like, like that's just hard to get, get, get your head around the dynamics that create that. Yeah, look, it is. I mean, it's uh, it's one of those ones we, when we sort of uh, you know first started looking at, at at some of the numbers that you know the boats could possibly do. We're like, oh, crikey, is that that can't be right. You know, that's uh, oh, you know, that's that, that can't be right. There must be something wrong. But you sort of kept breaking it down, and you know, you have to trust your tools because that's what you've sort of developed over the last you know uh, few years with with existing projects and things. And you go, well, actually, when you work it all out, um, the things are going to go pretty nicely. So um, yeah, no, it is it is incredible, and obviously the the boats being that little bit bigger and a little bit heavier that all sort of goes into the you know the writing moment pot if you like so a bit more power a bit more thrust and um you know and obviously foiling and, and having some really you know super efficient foils um you know with, with quite a lot of power um you know it turns into forward speed so um no it's going to be it's going to be pretty incredible and um you know with obviously going from a, a crew of uh you know six in the last campaign to now a crew of 11 um you know there's going to be a lot more people on 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 the boat to coordinate and and you know the whole the whole dynamics of of how you know the sailing team operates will be uh you know quite different to uh to previous there's no you know there's no no cycling um in the next one so everyone's back to grinding so that um you know that sort of changes things a little bit certainly for us and um you know some some great challenges there with uh you know systems be it electronically or hydraulically or mechanically it's um you know the wheel keeps rolling forward so a lot of that experience and and things you've learned previously that sort of fits into some places but there's also a whole host of new um new you know mechanical and engineering sort of challenges that um that that we're facing and and that's that's part of the game and the team that does sort of you know that sorts those out the the best um will ultimately have the uh, the best package and um you know be the team to beat the you know the makeup of the sailors and their backgrounds for the the last cup was fascinating with the with the cycling side of um power generation but if you look at the next cup and you look at the increase in the average race time there's you know legs that that range from 1.1 to 2.2 miles long there's a race course that is a maximum of 0.8 of a mile wide and then you've got like the land that might come into effect with some of the courses like particularly the one just south of north head i mean how does yes. that how does that change the the, the 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 crew strategy and the types of crew you need now for this boat um and and does this does this all provide even more opportunities for lead changes versus bermuda with the with these with these race course dynamics 
Yeah, look for sure, and that's um, you know that's one of the beauties about um, you know about Auckland Harbour. It's it's a it's a very very um, diverse um, you know uh, arena, if you like, for for sailing. It's it's it is absolutely one of the best places to go sailing in the world, and I think for spectators um, and from for viewing is uh, you know is one of the, um, the the natural sort of beauties of the Waitemata Harbour, if you like, is that. Um, yeah, it, it it is tricky at times. You've got um, you know tide, um, a lot of different tide currents in some places, and 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 shifting wind conditions, and sometimes um, fairly unpredictable um, conditions. So for for forecasting and for the weather side of things, absolutely there could be, um, you know, some teams will get it right one day and some teams won't, and that's um that's you know that's yachting at the end of the day. You know you've got to uh, do the best you can with with what you've got, and that includes the people within your team. So um, um, as a group, you need to work well together and you need to be um, flexible and be on your toes, you know, to be able to get the best out of your equipment, no matter what setups you have. And um, really, I think, um, you know, Auckland, I think, as a, as a venue, um, you know, everyone in New Zealand really loves their yachting. So uh, I don't think there'll be too many free spaces around the course to uh, <laughs> to park your boat, to be honest. So, um, re- you know, we're all really looking forward to being there. And, um, you know, I think um, that's what's going to provide such a, you know, thrilling um you know, thrilling viewing, I think, for so many people is the fact that there is, you know, pretty changeable conditions. So, um, you know, we've got to be absolutely, uh, you know, on, on, our, on our game, absolutely. And with the speeds and loads you're, you're dealing with now, um, are the sm- smaller, more highly dynamic, physically demanding fording classes the go-to place now for crew for these types of boats as opposed to big boat keelboat sailors and traditional match racing sailors from bigger bigger monohulls yeah look it's a it's a great great question i I think sort of as i may have mentioned uh, earlier on i think the the diversity that you you can have within your group whether it be from a a sort of a design side engineering side or even sailing team side i think having a, a really good diverse group of people that can work really well together um ultimately gives you a really really strong team and that's sort of what we had in the last campaign um you know we've got sort of big boat sailors we've got match racers we've got um skiff specialists multi hull specialists uh you know offshore specialists we've got a quite a good mix within our in our group and i think um you know we feed feed off each other we've got lots of ideas that get bounced around and i think you know crossover that a lot of our guys can do through the different classes i think is actually you know really good and i think that's what looking forward with you know all the teams i'm sure they've all looked at um you know the diversity has been you know, as being a good thing. I think if you're all, you know, if you had sort of 11 guys that all came from just a match racing background, you know, that wouldn't be good. And if you had all the guys that just came from a Olympic background, that wouldn't be good or, or just offshore, it wouldn't be good. I think having that really good mix is, is something that I think is key. And I think that's um, something where, you know, you don't really end up then with any major weaknesses in any areas because you can actually cover a lot of the holes that, that, that may be there, you know, if you all sort of come from the same mould, so to speak. So, um, you know, I think that's um, certainly with um, Emirates Team New Zealand, that's something that um, you know I think we're all very uh, very proud of is the fact that we are very you know sort of diverse in, in in not only just you know the sailing side but you know right the way through the design team engineering um, every, every department really is you know covers quite a, a broad base and um, you know obviously the strength of, a, of the whole team really is ultimately what uh, either creates success or failure and um, that's certainly something we've you know definitely kept in the back of our minds is 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 looking for those attributes. Mm-hmm. And do you think, uh, Glenn, these boats are going to be actually harder to sail than the cats? And, and then will, if they are, would will boat handling be an even bigger component of overall team performance rather than just outright speed at the next cup? Um, yeah, look, I, I think the boats will be extremely hard to sail. Um, you know, there will be big gains and losses in in doing the manoeuvres well and in, in crew work. Um, speed will certainly play a part. There hasn't been too many America's Cups um, that I can think of, if any, that the, the slower boat has actually won, won the event. So, um, you know, that's a that's a big uh, that's a big one to work on. But again, you have to be able to um, you know get the thing around the track. And um, you know, certainly in a place like Auckland where you know it's shifty and and puffy, you need to be able to you know do your manoeuvres well um, at will and I think that's something that certainly will, will, will play into teams um, you know into teams hands if they can manoeuvre well um, and, and get the boat around the track cleanly and actually hit their settings and hit their marks um, you know accurately and sail the boats well I think that's going to be a huge one and like you see with a lot of high performance classes if you get your settings slightly wrong um, you can be out the back door real fast and if you make a, a bad tackle jibe and you press a wrong button or your crew work 
work is is uh, under pressure is is not up to scratch you can you can have a huge loss and we saw that in the last America's Cup you know with with huge gains and losses through um, through just pure boat handling so um, that will absolutely um, you know come into play and um, ultimately at the end of the day you've got a you know the whole the whole team has to be on a tie game when uh, you know when the when the flag drops and that's um, that's something that you know obviously those um, pressure situations um, you know you have to be able to step up and um, and get the job done so that's certainly something that uh, you know uh, everyone will have to focus hard on at the end of the day but um, you know at that level you know you're expected to do your job well and ultimately that's you know where, why you get to do what you do I guess is you you know you hopefully do your job well and can trust those around you to do their jobs well and, and do it well together and that's what's um, you know that's what makes it pretty fun. Mm-hmm. And, um, and t- I know you probably can't talk exact numbers, but w- what's the likely true wind angle range for these boats in terms of foiling, you know, upwind and off the wind? Oh, look, it, it's a very, you know, <laughs> hard one to answer. I mean, in, in light breeze, um, you know, you'll be you'll be still going upwind <laughs> for foiling um, and, and downwind. And, and in strong breeze, you'll be going really well upwind and downwind foiling. So the boats are... Are designed to, to foil, you know, pretty much all the time. There'll be possibly some lighter conditions where, you know, it might be uh, tricky to to get foil. You know, if you're sailing to a lull or you're sailing to a puff, um, you know, there'll be some big gear changing. We'll, we'll, you know, the code zeros and that sort of thing, sails, um, you know, going up and down, that sort of thing. There'll be absolutely lo- those opportunities for, you know, a lot of crew work um, and a lot of, you know, decision making to as to what, you know, what sails you have on and, and what gear you use. So, um yeah, it's going to be it's going to be tricky, but the boat's performances upwind are um, you know uh, are very very good, and um, you know you you'd be you know <laughs> I don't re- I can't really give you it's a pretty stupid thing to say I be somewhere between thirty and seventy upwind because it doesn't really give you an idea, but you know you can actually sail the boats um, you know in breezy conditions you can do all sorts of different angles and uh, you know different you know, foils and your sails and your rig and your technique and hull shapes and all that sort of thing um, that'll dictate you know ultimately what is the best angle for, you know for some teams you know the boats might end up doing slightly different numbers at different angles and that's what's so exciting about the design side of things um, there is freedom to do you know different um, parameters in the, within the design and. You know that that'll end up being you know some teams' strengths and weaknesses in different conditions. So um, until you know ultimately you get close to race time, you won't really know what um, you know where your strengths and weaknesses are compared to your opponents. So hopefully you've you're in a position where you can have a, a bit of a, a range of, of of modes and range of true wind angles that you can sail well to um, you know put yourself in a strong position versus your opponent. Okay, and you just uh, you dropped out slowly for a couple of seconds there. Were you saying thirty to seventy degrees um, true wind angle upwind is kind of a, the range that, depending on wind strength, that'll be the norm for falling upwind. Yeah, look, I mean, anywhere within there, pretty much, you know, you can sort of do that with on a few other boats as well. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, it's, it's the old story. You want to get to the top mark as quick as you can and you want to get to the bottom mark as quick as you can. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, at this stage of the game, you know, we're still learning heaps as to what, you know, what the boats will do. You know, we, we, we won't really get an ultimate, you know, gauge on that until we actually sort of start sailing the things um, down the track. And, and you know, really, at the end of the day, there's just so much to learn. But um, you know, all we can say is that the the boat's performance upwind is is going to be probably. I don't we'll put it this way. I don't think there's going to be too many other boats that'll sail past you. That's for sure. Uh huh. Um, okay. And so, just like in terms of visualising this, are we going to? Uh, do you think we're going to see upwind starts where the boats are actually falling as they hit the start line and going flat out? You know. Perceivably, absolutely. I mean, that's the that's wow. the beauty about the pre-start. I mean, if you, as we saw last time in the in the last America's Cup with the reaching start, sometimes you know both boats are slow at the start. If you've got the you know your opponent locked out, you know yeah. it's, it's basically a displacement pivot and then a then a you know acceleration and a pop. I could you know, imagine seeing that on an upwind start as well. So um, there'll be times where you know both boats come in foiling. There'll be other times, I'm sure, where both boats come in slow and um, you know are, are really really tightly dialed up. So um, it depends on how well you do your pre-start. And that's the beauty about these boats is that there is so many options of what you do pre-start wise with your manoeuvres and, and how you actually get your opponent on the back foot. So that's one thing that we're very, um, you know, we were sort of excited about, I guess, when we when we sort of when this concept sort of concept started to come to fruition was that the fact that you you know you could sail a boat around in circles on the foils and there's not too many boats you can do that, you know, big boats like that that you could do that and and you know 
basically in a racing environment where you could um, you know effectively try and lock your opponent out. So a lot of options. I mean, a lot of crew work and a lot of things we don't know yet. But um, you know, that's the exciting part of the challenge. And you know, as time comes on, you know, seeing these big boats get thrown around like uh, like dinghies is is going to be something pretty cool. And that's something that um, you know I'm pretty fortunate to be be part of. And uh, and hopefully we can keep the thing uh, you know point keep the rig pointing in the air while you're doing that. <laughs> well, they're going to be spectacular. They really are going to be spectacular. Um... It's incredible. Okay, so just a question for you around. Um, I read uh, recently, even towards the end of last year, you had some challenges on the engineering side with forward development and them breaking under loads. Is, is that kind of under control now? Yeah, look, I, I really don't know exactly um, the full scenario behind behind all that. Um, you know, the, the the one design foil arms are um, you know a big, a, you know, obviously a, a very big, highly loaded component of the boat, and um, I think the, the the engineering and the, um, the the development work's ongoing with that um, over in Italy. And I think, as far as I know, everything's on track, and um, you know, that's, they're going to be a, a very key component of the uh, of the boat moving forwards. That um, are obviously they're going to see plenty of uh, plenty of wick, and um, you know they, they they pretty much hold the whole show up. So um, you know that's that's just one part of many that that, that needs to be um, you know engineered well. And as far as I know, everything's on track there. And so, Glenn, these the. The, the foils this time are they different to last time in the sense that they're ballasted as well as is, is, and, and in the absence of a keel is that is that part of the change to them yeah for sure like the the the, the foils definitely have a, a, a ballast component to them and basically the the self-riding capabilities of the boat um you know need ballast down low so basically when the both foil arms are completely in the down position um like it pretty much like you'd be at, at the dock um when the boat is on its side that you know hopefully will be enough uh you know um self-riding ability to actually flip the boats back up again up the right way so i mean obviously if it's blowing 20 knots and you, you roll the thing over um and you know who knows what will happen there if, if you don't get the angle of the boat right. It's probably a bit like a, um, you know, when you capsize your moth or, or your sailboard, if you don't get the, you know, if you don't get your um, your rig in the right spot, it's pretty hard to uh, to get the thing back up again. But, um, you know, all that sort of stuff we'll learn. But at the end of the day, the, um, you know, the foils are ballasted and that, again, gives you, um, you know, some riding moment as well, um, which gives you the power. Um, to, to make the go, boat go forward. So not only is, there, is it there for sort of the self-riding, um, it is also there to, uh, you know, give the boat power. When the boat actually, when the hull lifts out of the water, um, the riding moment increases quite a lot because you're actually taking the full load of the, uh, you know, the, the, the boat and the rig and the crew um, basically on this arm that's, you know, four and a half metres, five metres out to lure of you. So effectively, you, you, you know, um, you you, you increase your power quite a lot, so with that means you can take more uh, take more more power in, you can get more full time. I mean, that whole side of the wall you definitely a, um, a big load increase on on, on everything, and um, you need to trim accordingly. So um, yeah, it'll be, but um, you know, I think that's part of the, uh, the the nicety of having something new, and you know, those foil arms going up and down. You know they've got some, um, you know, pretty big loads on them, but um, you know the the, the 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 foil cant system that's that's been developed for those is 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 exceptional, and it's a it's a pretty um, amazing as a standalone piece of kit that that system alone is an absolute you know feat in engineering, and um, you know I think when the general public get to see you know how that's all been developed and how it all works and how quickly those foils can go up and down under under what load, it's um you know it's pretty it's pretty impressive, and that's something that um you know. Will, uh, won't be too far away from being seen. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Okay, and are you? Do you also change out the foil? So are you, are you able to adjust the balance? Uh, sorry, the, the amount of ballast on those foils as well, or are they fixed as part of the, the boat permanently? Yeah, look, it's pretty tightly controlled. So um, the, those you know big foil arms are sort of one design component. So they'll, they'll, every team will have the exact same foil arms and the, the foil wings, if you like, the horizontals at the bottom. Um, you know, each team gets to, uh, to to do what they like there. There is sort of volume restrictions and weight restrictions there. So it is reasonably restricted, but there is still, you know, an element of freedom in there, which the teams have to, you know, come up with the best um, solution to, you know, have the fastest, um, you know, the fastest foils within those boundaries so uh, again it's um, very similar to the last america's cup where you know definitely some areas of freedom but some one design componentry that um you know uh, everyone has to deal with as well okay and um in terms of you know monitoring the progress of other teams uh bernard sconey was quoted saying you've, you've got your eyes on the other teams and you know staying on top of how they're tracking in terms of their preparations and for for you guys is, is simulation a really critical part now of how 
how close to the your chest you can keep your cars until they run up to the cap? Um, look, there's there's always balances within you know um, simulation and getting on the water. Um, you know, obviously every team is sort of you know interested and, and keeps a keen eye on what what you know their opponents are doing. And um, certainly for us, you know, the, the simulation side of things was was uh, you know we used that or we were sort of we had to use that in the last campaign because we, we you know we obviously just couldn't get quite get on the water as early as we would would have liked. But ultimately, um, you know, I think every team will be um, you know utilising you know some pretty good tools and some pretty good software and um you know at the end of the day it's it's um you know it's the the human that actually programs the computer <laughs> um to 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 how it needs to be used to develop the the tools and the boat so uh, again having the right people in the right roles is, is key and um certainly for us you know we um you know we'll be doing uh, hopefully a really good balance of both um you know obviously you know testing indoors um through computer simulation and, and vpp but also um ultimately being on the water and actually, uh, you know, getting out there and getting wet, getting spray in your eyes and, and, and working out, you know, what sort of angles you can do best out in the water and getting a feel for the, um, you know, the venue that we'll be sailing in. So, uh, yeah, lots of, lots, of, lots of factors go into, you know, ultimately what's going to give you the best package, but it's how accurately and how efficiently you, uh, you utilise that information ultimately gives you the, um, the pathway to make the right decisions for what equipment you build and, um, you know, also how you use that equipment going forwards. In terms of, you know, what's fixed with the design and where there's room for innovation uh, in, in this class of boat, do you, I mean, do you envisage the, the speed, speed margins between the fastest and slowest teams will be bigger or smaller than Bermuda in terms of the scope available now? Oh, it's a hard one, hard one to answer. I think rule-wise, the you know the boats are, are, are pretty tightly restricted in 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 a lot of areas. So I would almost think guessing, and this is just a, you know my personal guess, not based on anything else, is that I think the boats will all be you know very very similar um, in their performances in in a lot of the conditions because you know there's only so much you can do within the rules and and the you know the rigs are uh, you know there's quite a few things fairly tightly controlled and um, you know I think the racing is going to be uh, you know pretty t- pretty tight and pretty fierce so um yeah we'll have to wait and see but um you know my feel is that you know it's, it's absolutely going to be a yacht race and um the teams that that you know can uh, get the boat around the track well um you know are going to be hard to beat uh, absolutely well um i certainly can't wait to see these boats in action uh, later this year or as soon as they as soon as the full size ones are on the water it's going to be fantastic to see um so Glenn, um, is there anything else you want to touch on? Anything else you want to mention or share before we wrap up? I'm, I'm conscious you're on a on a bit of a deadline, been at the airport, but um, is there anything else you want to touch on at all? Yeah, no. Look, I'm I'm, I'm pretty good. I've uh, got about 15 minutes before I've got to go and uh, and board, so I might go and get myself a uh, a motorbike magazine and, and sit down and have a read and a dream of uh, you know what the uh, what the future might be in a couple of years when I get to uh, go up the east uh, east coast up to up to Cape York. So I'll go and uh, I'll go and have a look at what's uh, what's on the forefront of the motorcycling world. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, Glenn, thank you so much for putting aside the time. I really appreciate you um, appearing on the Ocean Sailing Podcast, and I wish uh, you and uh, Emirates Team New Zealand, who I've been following since 1987, before they were even Emirates Team New Zealand, um, <laughs> um, and I'm a huge long-term fan, so I wish you guys the huge, hugest amount of success in the next America's Cup, because you certainly deserve it. No no worries, Dave. Good on you. T- take it easy, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep in touch. Okay, sounds good. All Thanks, right. Glenn. Thanks, mate. Good on you, mate. See ya, boy. If you've enjoyed this episode with Glenn Ashby and want to find out more, I've uh, linked to the protocol for the upcoming America's Cup as well as the notice of race with the intended course areas and configurations on Auckland Harbour uh, at both the Ocean Sailing Podcast website and in the Ocean Sailing Podcast Facebook group. So check those out uh, for more information. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to David at oceansailingpodcast.com.au. See you next week. People walk into me and say I'm sorry. I want to look back. I want to talk to them. Sometimes I wonder how they've lived a life like this before Some are just so damn young So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them out Turn around cause you're watching them cry And watch
watching some getting ready to die Then knocked down to the ground and can't get back up Feelings are sad, I want to be mad Days here are like precious gold If you live another one, you have faith to carry on So turn around Turn around and help them out Turn around cause you're watching them cry And watching some getting ready to die The memory of their courage is taped in my head It plays a soft one I painted a picture of the past I picture cold, dark sand and skies I painted the future how it's supposed to be With warm sun and a bright town So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them laugh Turn around cause you're watching them cry And watching some getting ready